Man, what a week. I want a big thank you to uh, Pastor Ed Bonio for coming and speaking last week while I was uh, visiting my father in Oregon. I uh, listened to it as I was driving uh, through Portland, because you should be listening to the Word of God and praying when driving through Portland these days, amen? And uh, on my way home, and what a great job, have an emergency plan, have a plan in place, amen? So he did a great job, and of course, we had a few other things happen uh, this week. Uh, I was able to uh, officiate a wedding of two uh, young individuals, yes, a uh, beautiful young lady and a uh, shady character that she decided to link up with. If I could have Jonathan and Hannah come up here for just a moment, yeah. Yes, it was a it was a fabulous ceremony, and I did something for the first time. I've never done this before. I officiated the wedding and was a groomsman all at once. So I confused a lot of people, but I got to wear a tux. I didn't have to worry about what to wear, but uh, it was a it was an awesome ceremony. Now a lot of you uh, uh, may have missed this. Uh, it was at Canvas Church in Kalispell, beautiful beautiful facility. Uh, so we're going to just do a, a really quick reenactment. And, and there's really only one part Jonathan wanted to reenact, but I added a couple lines just before it. So if you guys would take your spots uh, just as we did. Now, we, we look just a, a little bit different, but uh, okay, here we go. Those who God has joined together, let no man put us under. And so much as Jonathan and Hannah have consented together in holy wedlock and have witnessed the same before God in this company, having given and pledged their faith each to the other, and having declared, you still want to go through with, with this, right? Okay. <laughs> having declared the same by the giving and receiving of rings, I pronounce that you're a husband and wife. Jonathan, you may kiss your bride. <laughs> All right. So for the first time before this church, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Mr. and Mrs. Jonathan Ziegler. <laughs> Amen. So good. And is that, I mean, right there, isn't that just what a wedding ceremony should be? Yes. When you go to a wedding, maybe just like four sentences and you're out and it's cake time? Yes. Praise God. I like that. That was a, that was a good service right there. No, it was beautiful. And I am, uh, I'm so proud of both of them, but I'm really proud of the journey that Jonathan has, has been on. I've been there with him during this journey and I know a lot of things. Don't worry, I won't share with him. Uh, but you know, before the service, God had, had spoken to my heart to do something. When Jonathan was getting ready to go to Afghanistan, for those of you who don't know, he served in the military, and his family gathered together up at the house I live in now, uh, Jim and Renee were living there at the time, and we prayed over him, uh, Papa Bob was there, and we have some pictures from that day, and, and, and we gave him a penny, and I took this penny and I put it on top of a lamp and I said, now, this is going to be here waiting for you when you get back because God promises this is going to be okay. You're coming back. And uh, we had a moment there, and, and that was how many years ago? 2013, 2012, so eight years ago. And uh, so as I'm getting ready for the ceremony, God's like, grab a penny and give it to him. And remind him that the promise of me bringing Hannah to him just came, just came true. Because we talked a lot about God having someone special just for him. So I gave him that penny, and, and that was such an awesome and surreal moment, really. Um, and uh, it just proves God, God has his promises. He makes his promises, and he comes through. Amen? Because I think you'll all agree with me. Jonathan married way over his head. Amen? <laughs> Amen? I mean, that's an obvious miracle of God right in front of us. Amen? So congratulations, guys. Congratulations. I see my friend Johnny Padilla here with me today. Yeah, <laughs> praise God. I was visiting with him uh, earlier in the week, and uh, man, I just love your, your confidence in who your Savior is and living every day to the maximum that he will allow and to your potential. So we love you and are praying for you for a quick and speedy recovery because Johnny's got things to do. He's got a ministry in, in, in Arizona that God has set him on, and um, and we're, we're, we're so pleased to have you here today with us. Also be praying for uh, Eric. Uh, he is not in our drum cage today, uh, but luckily we have our one-man marching band with us today. Ben, back on the guitar, yeah. 
Uh, Eric is uh, struggling with some things that doctors can't quite put their finger on right now, but we know God knows what's going on. Uh, so we continue uh, to pray for a, a healing in his body as well. And uh, being in a household with a, with a brand new baby and then so many things to do. And he does so much here at the church that you'll never know uh, behind the scenes. So be praying for uh, Eric as well. Um, some more announcements for you. Rex and Ella are going to be moving to Klamath Falls, Oregon this coming week. And we are needing several volunteers to assist with loading a U-Haul truck for them. Uh, it's going to be Tuesday at 1 o'clock. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet out on the table in the lobby if you'd like to help. And also a card for them if you'd like to sign it to wish them well on their new journey. Now, this has been a long journey for Rex and Ella. And, uh, you know, I've had conversations with Rex. He's, he's keeping his head up. He's, he's uh, trying to understand God's plan in all of this. Uh, and if we really look at it and the fact that they're going to be going back to live with family in Klamath Falls, Oregon that can... Um, help take care of Rex and, and the new challenges that he has, but he hasn't lost sight of the fact that there's a ministry involved in that as well. God knows. So be praying for that family and lifting them up, but also if you can help in loading them up, again, Tuesday at 1 o'clock, sign up sheet out on the counter so we know how many people uh, that we have. Also, the clothing bank is having a back-to-school event for uh, Plains families next week. It's going to be Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday from 9 to 7. Uh, families can come in to pick out clothing item, items that the crew have set aside all year and are also some brand new clothing that have been donated uh, by a congregation member. Uh, the crew uh, has also raised $400 through special donated items to purchase new backpacks for the students. And uh, through different donations, school supplies were also purchased uh, for the kids as well. This is going to be a different year for the kids. Um, they're going to be attending two days of the week. Uh, and they have split the split them down the middle, so half the students are two days and half the students are the other two. So also keep in prayer all the students, the faculty members, uh, the staff, everyone that's going to have to adjust to what this is uh, because it's going to be very different for them. But uh, we are trusting that uh, God has a plan in that as well, but we, we are trying to step up and supply uh, school supplies and things of that nature that uh, uh, parents may be struggling with purchasing this year. So if you know anyone that can take advantage of that, please let them know uh, that we will be doing that. And you can see Jessica uh, for any additional info on those two announcements, school supplies or uh, Rex and Ella's move. So we're going to enter into worship. The sermon I'm going to preach to you today it's called, I Hear a Leak. Now, when the Lord speaks to me, I do my very best to listen. And the Lord spoke to me, said, you need to go see your dad. I'm like, okay, I'm on it. I'm going to go do that. So Ed Vinyl was, was uh, kind enough to speak, and, and I went to see my dad, and some things unfolded there uh, for me personally, and it, it, was, it was a divine thing. It was, I was meant to be there for that time. Well, Something happened while I was there that uh, uh, God put a sermon, uh, put a word in my heart as I was crawling underneath my house there in Oregon, uh, talking to a spider that I named Rick. And uh, we'll get more into, into that uh, uh, interesting story, but, but God laid a word on, on my heart, and I'm, I'm very excited to share it with you. Uh, as most of the time, when I start out with this message, if you hear something that seems challenging or maybe you don't like, just hang out for a little bit. I'll wrap it up and it'll come back around. But God spoke to me and we're in such a challenging time, such a challenging time in this world. Uh, Ed showed me something uh, this morning that I think uh, sums it up. And I'm not going to get it exactly right, but it says something to the effect of, I think we're we're past Jesus take the wheel. He actually needs to pull the car over and swat us all with a flip-flop. Yeah? <laughs> so I think our world's there. Uh, so, uh, you know, let's prepare our hearts to worship our king because not everybody woke up this morning. Not everybody had breath in their lungs. Not everybody has the ability to worship their king. But you know what? Today, in this place, we do. We're here. There is breath in our lungs. He is, this is an ordained moment. This is a divine opportunity to worship our King. 
And we should take advantage of those every single day. Because I'm telling you what, if you haven't caught on to it already, life is very short and fleeting. It truly is but a vapor. This moment, this day is going to go by like that. But I want to be one. I want to be counted as one that worshiped my king today. That praised and glorified him for all of the blessings in my life. That wasn't heard complaining. That wasn't heard wanting. But was heard saying, thank you for what you have given me in this life. Let's worship our king today with that kind of passion. And prepare this place for the word he wants us to hear. Bless your church with tongues of fire. Holy Spirit, move. Leave no trace of man's desire. Spirit burn out through Spirit burn Spirit burn Spirit burn Spirit burn Bless your church with songs of Let the light of heaven shine 
for I long to respond to you. And all my love is for you. And all my love is yours. And all surrounding me let it break at your name still call the sea to still the rage in me to still every way at your name Jesus Jesus you make the darkness 
covered by a grace so free and here I am knowing I'm a sinful man covered by the blood of the Just as I am, empty handed but alive in your hands, your majesty. Sanctified by glory and fire And now I found The greatest love of all Is mine Since you laid down your life The greatest sacrifice
grace has found me just as I am. We thank you. Empty handed, but alive in your hands. Oh, singing now, just Father, we praise and glorify your name in this place. Father, we lift you. We lift you up to your rightful place, Father, as our Lord and Savior. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. You may have had a bad day. Maybe you've had a bad week, a bad month, a bad year. Maybe the last couple years have been bad. Maybe you have suffered loss of a loved one. Maybe you're having sleepless nights over one who is still living yet lost spiritually. The Lord wants you to know whatever the enemy has apparently taken, he is restoring. Whatever the enemy appears to be doing, God is doing something different. God is doing something more. God is doing something new in your life. He is doing something new in your loved one's lives. He is in control. He is in charge. Do not focus on what the enemy has taken, but focus on what God has given. Do not focus on what the enemy would say. Focus on the truth of what God has spoken into your life. Do not forget the promises. Do not forget the blessings. Do not forget the times that God has intervened because he will do it again and again and again and again. Do not give the enemy credit where credit is not due. But give your God the praise where praise is due. Thank you, Jesus. Focus on these things and you will see miracles. Focus on these things and you will see him at work in your life. Focus on these things. For the enemy roams about seeking who he may devour. But you are not someone he may devour. You are a child of God. Stand upon his promises. Walk boldly into this new world. Do not seek out the negative. Do not seek out the lies. Focus on the truth. Thank you, Jesus. Father God, I glorify and praise you in this place today, Father. It is amazing to me you never cease to show up. And Father, I ask today, Lord God, that as always, the words you've given me, Father, let them be yours, not mine. Father, the way that they be delivered, let it be in your tone, not mine. You are in complete charge of this word, for it is yours. You are in complete charge of this house because it is yours. And you are in complete charge of these people, all of us, because we are yours. But Father, I ask that this word would go to our hearts, Father that we would hear it, that we would receive it, that we would match it up with the standard that is you, the standard that is your word, and the standard that is the truth. Father, I pray that we leave here on a mission. That we leave here on a mission to live boldly for you and to leave a world it would have us do otherwise behind. It is time for your people to step up. Father, I pray that you instill that in us today. And we will give you all the honor, all the glory and praise. In Jesus' sweet name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, worship team. Great job. Ah, super job, yes. Ben never ceases to amaze me with playing everything short of a harmonica up there. And how he can do that, I don't know. But This sermon that uh, I have for you today called I Hear a Leak, 
I want everybody to, to understand, I know I've said it before, but it's really important to me that everybody understands that I don't come by these messages lightly and that everything you hear me say is something that God has driven into me, something that God has challenged me on, something that God has, has drug me around by the hair before it ever gets to this point. So it's personal. So I believe it. So I live it. It's part of my story. It's why I can confidently deliver it. And know that every word is always out of love. I've Sometimes I've been told I can come across a little strong. Sometimes I've been told I feel like you're yelling at me. And maybe I am. But I've told you it's a bit the passion that God has placed in me. Because I love my children with all my heart. And if one of them was about to be hit by a car, I really don't think I would say, Kayla, thou shalt move, for a car may have hit you. I think I'm probably going to scream at the top of my lungs for her to get out of the way. And God has placed, a, placed us in a time, and it's not by mistake that he's put you here today, and it's not by mistake that you live in the year 2020 in Plains, Montana, because only you are capable of doing what he needs us to do as a church. That's an honor. You could have been born and lived in some much simpler times. You could have, you could have just walked into church and walked out and had a more a simple relationship with God, but he called you here now because he needs you. And the people of this world we live in need him. So I went to visit my dad. Now, it's no secret I love my dad. It's no secret that I look up to my dad. It's, it's no secret that we had a great relationship and still do, that we raced motorcycles with each other every weekend, that I have so many amazing memories. So when God told me you need to go see your dad, I I knew it was important, so I went. I took my son Darren with me, and I had my bag packed, and, and I'm looking at it as I'm going to go see my dad, and I'm going to relax a little bit, and this is, a, this is my childhood home, and I'm going to go back to my town, and, and I'm getting ready to walk out, and God says, oh, wait, you need to pack your work clothes. Well, no, God, I don't intend. I don't need my work clothes there. I'm not, get your work clothes. Oh, boy. So I went back and I packed the stuff that I don't mind getting messed up. And I drove there and met up with my dad. And we visited that night. And one of the first things he said is, I was just sitting here contemplating what to do because I don't think I can get under the house anymore, but I hear a leak. And I thought, here we go. Here's going to be day one of rest. So I said, Dad, of course, you send me in. I'll go in there. Now, I lived in that house my entire life. I was brought home there as a baby. I'd never been underneath it for good reason. There can't be anything good under there happening, right? And my dad had been under it many times, so he knew exactly what he thought he heard, and he figured he knew what it was. So the next day, I got dressed and went out, and he took the deal off, and I began my journey underneath the house. Now, there's not a lot of clearance, and of course, there's a leak, so there's some moisture down there now, and I'm working my way past, and the cobwebs are amazing, and I come across one cobweb with this black spider just looking at me, and I looked at it, and I thought, should I kill this thing, and I thought, he doesn't appear to be harming anything, and so I named him Rick. What else do you do, right? So I crawl a little bit further, and I can see the leak. I can see what's happening, and it's in the T that my dad said it probably would be in. So I took this all apart, and I knew this had to be the culprit. My dad had told me it was the culprit, and I pulled it off of the brass pipe, and it was a plastic T that had been put there some years ago. And I began my journey back and told Rick, I'll be right back. Got to grab some tools. And we went, we went and we looked for this particular T and the adapters that we needed, and we could not find them anywhere. We went to so many places, even specialized plumbing places, and we couldn't find exactly what we needed. Finally, after hours of looking, we discovered what we needed, and I was so happy and so pleased by this. And I had gotten to spend some time 
with my dad in this journey of, of trying to find these plumbing parts. So we got back, and I confidently crawled back underneath the house. A quick wave to Rick on my way by. Got to the tee. I put, put all this new stuff on, and I yelled to Darren because my dad has to go clear to the top of the road to turn the water back on. I yelled to Darren, turn it on. We're good. We're good. I heard the water rushing, and it came into the house and promptly hit me square in the face and begin to flood everything underneath me again, and so I began to scream again, turn it off, turn it off, turn it off. And my son sat there and stared at me, obviously not hearing me. Rick seemed to be getting a little bit anxious. Finally, I got the, it across, I got to my dad, and they turned it off, and I thought, all of this for nothing, we gotta get this fixed, the day's winding down. How could that connector not have worked. So, so I began to pull the connector back off and let the water drain back out. And I went back and got a piece of sandpaper and I began to brush off one of the copper pipes on the side it was leaking. And lo and behold, guess what was under there? A couple little holes. There were holes in the pipe. It was never the connector's fault. It wasn't what we had perceived was the problem. We had spent all day trying to fix this connector, thinking it was going to stop our leak. And all along, all we had to do was brush off the debris to find the real problem. You see, the holes underneath could not be seen until I brushed them off, until I removed the debris. And that's the moment as I was doing that and discovered the holes that the Holy Spirit spoke to me. Because... I went back and got a hacksaw, and I got back underneath that thing, and it was just right on the end, and I just cut a fresh end off, and I put the old connector back on. And guess what? No leak. The leak had been fixed just as simple as that. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, you assumed the connection was the problem. You didn't look at the structural pipe itself. You didn't move the debris. You moved too quickly because of your assumption. So that's what sent me down this road. Because in a similar way, we work off of assumptions about what is causing our life to leak. See, it must be the neighbor. It must be the politics. It must be the church I attend. It must be the community that I live in. It must be the job that I have. If I could only get a new job, if I could only move to a new community, if I could only go to a different church, if I could take care of that connector, the leak in my life is going to stop. But it's not the connector. And today I want to address the role that sin plays in causing a leak underneath our house. Now this is where I want you to pay attention because the minute you mention sin, people automatically will say, well, I am a sinner, but I am saved by grace. Therefore, I am not subject to this any longer. Now, hear what I have to say, because it's going to loop all the way back around. In Isaiah, we read where God's people could hear a leak. And they began to speculate as to what the cause was, and they made assumptions about who God is. And Isaiah, the prophet, had to set them straight. We read in Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, or his ear dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. God's people were wondering why God did not seem to rescue them from their trials. They wondered if perhaps God had diminished in his strength. If his hand had become shortened, and Isaiah assures them that God does not lack strength. So then they move to perhaps he lacks knowledge of our problem or even interest in our problem. Maybe he doesn't care. But it's not the situation at all because as, as Isaiah reminds us, God's ear is not heavy and he can hear us just fine. He then informs them that the problem isn't with God's power. It isn't with his knowledge. And it isn't with his interest. The problem lies within their iniquities. Sin has separated them from God. Now sin causes separation still today. 
It does not necessarily separate us from the presence of God because we know that God is present everywhere. It says in Psalms chapter 139, 7 through 12, Well, where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. God is omnipresent. He does not create separation from us. We create it from him. And he is always closer than you think in the middle of your situation. He does care. He does know. He is paying attention. But there's still a way that we cause separation. And one way that Satan causes us to move away is by turning our focus away from God's purpose and towards things disguised as having eternal value. We begin to have column B discussions and debates. I call them column B because I have a, I have a rule as a pastor. I have column A, that means it's of eternal value. I'm going to drop everything that I'm doing to cover a column A. But if it's column B, let's have coffee sometime. Because column B, if it is not of eternal value, I am not going to waste my entire afternoon having that discussion. One of the biggest ones I hear, the largest theological debate or a column B discussion involves once saved, always saved. And I've of the mind, how about we concentrate on the ones that we know are not saved? This debate can go on and on and on. If you've ever been a pastor, and there are some in this building today, you've heard it. You've heard the debates. You've heard all the theological discussions around it. And opinions generally land in one of two groups. One group says, once you're saved, you're always saved. And the other group says, if you sin and willfully continue in it, you can be lost. I like how one professor put it. I belong to a denomination that believed in backsliding, and they actively practiced it. I'm not going to get too deep into this issue, but I have no doubt that the Bible teaches that we should fear falling into sin. And we should walk with humility and reverence towards God rather than away from him. No one should ever take advantage of God's grace or use it as an excuse. Because if you are truly a Christian, a Christ follower, a person who has been born again by putting your faith in Jesus Christ, your life will reflect that change. End of story. See, if you commit to eating different and you join a gym and you actually use it, so I've been told, your body will reflect that change. See, you can't just tell everyone, well, I have a Planet Fitness membership, so any day now, this is just going to get cut. This is going to be amazing. Well, have you been there? Well, I go, you know, when I can. Once every four or five weeks, I find my way to Planet Fitness. But I have the membership card. They even gave me a T-shirt, which is getting a little tight. I don't know why. And, and you know, once every four or five weeks, I go to Chick-fil-A. I grab myself a quick bite to eat, and I go to Planet Fitness. But it's not enough. There's not an actual genuine commitment. And everybody can tell. I can flash a fitness membership card in front of you, but you will see the proof of whether I actually attend or not. Church is much the same way. We've put church in a Planet Fitness situation. Well, I go. When I can make it, I go. When I can get there, I go. When I can read my Bible, I try to read my Bible. I mean, I'm a Christian. I've got the card. I've got the card. But the problem is, people who are really looking to get their life into shape and to stop their leak can look at you and understand whether you truly attend your gym or not. They'll know whether the truth is in you. Because through that sin, because through your reluctancy to push your relationship with Jesus closer, you've caused separation. The world in which we live today is full 
of self-proclaimed believers in the man upstairs. That's my favorite. Whenever somebody wins or, or they're being interviewed in a sport, well, I just like to thank the man upstairs. That's not his name. His name is Jesus. If you can't proclaim his name in front of the masses, if you can't say it behind a microphone, you just have the card. You're not living it out and you're not affecting anybody. Well, I don't, I don't want to offend anybody. I would hate for my sponsors to let me go. I would, I would hate to lose all that money. You just have the card. You enjoy your card. You go your once every six weeks, but you're not making the impact. You're not doing what God gave you that stage for. 1 John chapter 1, 7 through 10. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all right unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. See, John first deals with a false claim to fellowship. Based upon this, we understand that it is possible for some to claim a relationship with God that they actually do not have. And we can also say that it is possible for someone to think that they have a relationship with God that they do not have. Well, how do we know for sure? The discernment of the Spirit. Spirit. How do we know for sure? The proof is in the pudding. Do they have a spiritual six-pack? Do they have some spiritual biceps? Or is their spiritual life just flapping in the wind, flabby as can be? Because they don't go to the gym. The Bible says that you will be a new creature. The old things passed away. And behold, new things have come. See, when a child of God sins, the peace and joy of the Lord in your life becomes broken. You can almost feel it lift from you. There is a conviction of the Holy Spirit, and that is what you are feeling. A conviction that causes us to hear the leak. But if you think it's the connector, you'll go to church and you'll feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit and you'll say, somebody needs to take that microphone away from that guy. He's mean. He yells at me. I don't want to sit under that type of preaching. What you don't want to sit under is the truth. You don't want to sit under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm not talking just to the people within this building. I'm talking to the church at large in our nation. We live in a nation that kills me every time I see the statistics pop up during election time. Well, we know that about 70% of our nation is still Christian. Go to a metropolitan area sometime, spend yourself a couple days, and see if you believe that 70% of that population are truly Christians. Truly Christians. And find out how many you think are just floating the Planet Fitness card. Because that's what we're in. And truth hurts. And truth divides. And truth stings. And truth causes people to get angry. And truth causes people to lash out. It's biblical. Read the Bible. Truth made people upset. And it still does. But what it should do for a true believer is inspire. Is inspire confidence. Inspire confidence that you can spread the good news of Jesus Christ and love in every possible situation. Conviction of the Holy Spirit, not a conviction of a minister. I'll hold that power. Not the conviction of a church, not the conviction of a denomination. The conviction of the Holy Spirit, it's what we feel when we need to turn about face and do something different. Peace can be restored when you sincerely repent and commit yourself to doing what God wants. Now here's where I want to make a point. I'm not talking about your eternal salvation. I'm not talking about as a believer you sin. 
you turn away, you're doing things that God would not have you do and the Holy Spirit convicts you and you better say hey, you're sorry real quick or the rapture happens and you're going to get left behind. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that God's people should push to be more because the enemy has successfully created a template that says this is what church looks like and this is what Christians look like and they better toe the line and stay within that box and as long as they do, they can believe they're making a difference but I'm satisfied with keeping them at bay. If you are a child of God, you should be jumping up and down and saying, nobody's going to hold me back from making a difference. The Spirit of God resides in me. He gives me the power. He gives me the ability. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That should be our cry. That should be our passion. Peace can be restored when you sincerely repent. And we know that God loves sinners. He said so in Romans 5, 8. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. But our sin can still cause separation. It can separate us from the fellowship with God. Because at least at the point of our sin, we no longer are thinking alike. We're no longer in a like mind with God. Saul showed us that. In 1 Samuel 15, 23, and by the way, anytime I need to throw anybody under the bus, biblically, Saul is on the top of my list. 1 Samuel 15, 23, for rebellion is as the sin of divination, and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. In Saul's empty religious practice, his rebellion, and his stubbornness against God, he rejected God's word, so God rightly rejected him as king over Israel. Saul no longer thought alike with God, and he proved it in the next verse. And people still do this to this day. 1 Samuel 15, 24, Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. For I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your word. If you'd stopped right there, it would have been great. But then he said, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. He almost found the leak. But then he said, but I know it's the connector. I know it's the T. If we could just fix those people from causing me to sin then everything would be okay, Samuel. Saul's statement began like a genuine confession, but it changed. He refused to own up to his own sin and instead blamed the people who made him do it. He heard the leak, but instead of removing the debris and finding the hole, he blamed the connector. Sin also separates us from the blessing of God. Because at least at the point of our sin, again, we are not trusting God and relying on him. James described strife amongst Christians with the terms war and fights. Often the battles that happen amongst Christians are bitter and sometimes can be severe. Let's get one thing straight. We shouldn't be fighting amongst each other. We just shouldn't be. We should be praying for one another. We should be uplifting one another. We should be supporting one another. We're a family. And not just in these walls. Churches around our county here who believe in Christ crucified, who believe that Jesus rose from the dead, that he, that he saved us, that we have eternity with him, those, those are our brothers and sisters in Christ. We're on the same team. They may have a different version of once saved, always saved. They may have a, a, a different take on one of those column B things, but who cares? God didn't ask us to debate all that stuff. He asked us to, he gave us the great commission, and in that great commission, he did not say, thou shalt have coffee every Wednesday and argue doctrine. He said, reach the lost. Reach the ones that you know are lost. And if you're a Christian and you're not just a card-carrying member, you understand that that should burn within you to make a difference. James chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. 
What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are to war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. The source of wars and fights amongst Christians is always the same. There is a root of our carnal nature, an internal war within the believer regarding the lusts of our flesh. No two believers who are both walking in the spirit of God towards each other can live with wars and fights amongst themselves. Now you may come across a person who doesn't want to receive your love. You may come across a person that doesn't believe what we've just read, but is your responsibility to believe and act upon what we just read. It doesn't mean you guys have to have Christmas dinner together. It doesn't mean that you have to be besties. But it means you have to love them. You have to pray for them. Even if they use you or persecute you. I think that's in the Bible somewhere. And hey, I'm with you. You're all thinking of that one person right now. So lucky I can't read minds. And I'm lucky you can't read mine. We've got that person. Why won't they just accept? Why do they have to be angry with me? Why do they have to spread these lies? Why, 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 why? Quit asking why and start asking how. How do I pray for them, God? How do I affect their lives, God? How can I make a difference for you? Sin separates us from some of the benefits of God's love as well. We read the story of the prodigal son in Luke 15. He was still loved by the father, but he didn't enjoy the benefits of his love when he was actively in sin. He removed himself from the presence of the father. It's easy for us to blame our problems as the worship team comes forward. It's easy for us to blame our problems on everything except our iniquities. I've done it a million times. We'll blame God before seeing that the problem is with us. And we will deny who God is before seeing the problem is with us. I don't know how many times my beautiful wife and I have had this conversation where she sits hopelessly and listens to me in my complete idiotic rant about how badly I need to get out of Plains, Montana. They might as well have named this place Nineveh. And name me Jonah. I tried so hard to get out of here. And for some reason, every job interview turned into a dead end. Every time I went through a process as a police officer, it would start with 400 or more candidates. And I got down to the last five, three separate times in the state of Oregon. And all three times I didn't get the job. And I saw the other four guys. And somehow, the doors just kept shutting. I remember leaving that parking lot one day. I got into my car, and my father-in-law, Jim, was walking by, and he knew I was going to interview for a position. And he said, hey, drive, si- drive safe, and bad luck. The only time anyone's wished me bad luck. I tried. I kicked. I fought. I did everything I could do to get out of here. Because planes was the problem. Planes was the problem. It couldn't have been what was going on in my heart. Planes was the problem. I was a bank manager and there weren't enough banks. I was a police officer and there wasn't a large enough budget. It was always Sanders County. It was always Plains that was the problem, even though I knew God put me here. It was always the connector that was causing the leak. And I would shop, and I would shop, and I would shop. And I would replace the connector, and the leak was there. And I would change another connector, and the leak was there. And I'd add another connector. And then one day God was like, hey, why don't you just brush the dirt off? Oh my goodness, there's some holes. And then God got a hold of my heart and he says, I tell you what, if you'll let me, 
I'll just cut that piece off. You're not going to have a leak anymore. It took me a lot of years, but I allowed him to cut that off. No more leak. We want to blame God. We want to deny who he is. We want to blame it on the connector. But the truth is we're responsible to brush the dirt off and find out what's really underneath. If you can say today, I hear a leak, don't assume it's the connector. The challenge for us today is brush the dirt off, find the holes, and cut them off. Allow God to cut it off. God doesn't want you spending time underneath the house anymore. See, my dad said something to my son. And my son related to me. He said, Peepaw, that's what he calls him. He said, Peepaw was upset that you had to be under the house. And he told me, he said, I'm the dad. I'm the father. I should be fixing this. I hate that he has to do this. Your father loves you. He wants to fix it. He does not want you to spend your time underneath the house naming your spiders. He wants to fix it. He wants you to get out. He wants you to seal it up, never to return to that leak so that you can take what you've learned and go help fix somebody else's. Heavenly Father, I praise and glorify your name. I thank you for these people. I thank you for each person that's here, Father, because, again, it's never by mistake. And, Father, I pray that as you have challenged each of us today, myself included, that we would begin to brush off the dirt, that we would begin to examine and find where the leak is truly coming from, and that we wouldn't sit and desire that your grace be so much applied to us in our situation, but that we would pray and desire that your grace be introduced to others. We don't even know of its existence. Father, help us. Let you fix our leaks so that we can help fix others. Father, you are calling upon your church like never before. And this is a particular time we have been called for a time such as this right now. Let us grab on to that. Let us not be fearful. Let us be inspired. Let us not walk towards the battle. Let us run towards the battle. Knowing that victory has already been obtained through the sacrifice of your son, Jesus. He defeated death, hell, and the grave. Therefore, there is nothing to fear. Father, I pray for peace for every family represented here. And Father, for those that want to walk out of this place today thinking that somehow the conviction of the Holy Spirit is just a bad preacher. Father, I pray that your spirit be with them. That you whisper in their ear and that you never let them go. Father, we thank you so much for your blessings, so much. I thank you so much for this church, so much for these people. And these altars will be open if you have anything to pray about. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Johnny, what's going on in your body right now is a lie. It's a lie. The enemy sees the greatness that God has called out on you. It does not matter what the physical age is. God has more for you. He has more for you. What's going on is a lie. You grab onto his truth. Doris, what's been going on in your body, a lie. 
He has purpose and destiny for you yet to be obtained. You know that. You've heard that in a word he gave you. Stand upon that because the enemy is lying to many people within this congregation right now. Thank you, Jesus. Father God, I praise and glorify your name. Father, let us walk out of here. Let us stand boldly for you, Father, because we know the truth. We know you are the healer, Father. We know that you have purpose and destiny for our lives. We accept that, Father. We grab a hold of that right now in the name of Jesus. We will not be an average church. We will not just be another place. You have called us to greatness as your children. We accept that call right now. Let us walk out of this place changed. Let us walk out of this place ready because you are bringing an outpouring of your spirit that cannot be contained. Father, let us be a part of that and let us rush towards it, not being timid, with no anxiety whatsoever. Let this be the moment it happened right now where everything changed. In Jesus' sweet and precious name we pray. Amen. Just one.
just want to be near your heart There is nothing like your love There is nothing 